I got to just tell you where we've been. We're in a series called Encounters, and we're looking at people in the Bible that encounter God. Check this out. They encounter God. And how many know when you encounter Him, you don't stay the same? Come on, man. When you encounter Him, you, you can't stay the same. You don't stay the same. He changes you. And uh, so we're looking at people in the Bible that encountered Him, and we're looking at their experience, what happened when they encountered Him. We're looking at their experience. Check this out. And then we're going to learn from their experience. Hello, Bezel T3. That was Steve Abraham of New Life Community Church in Oxnard, California. Steve and his co-pastor wife Tammy planted New Life Community Church in 1997, starting with 50 people, and it has now grown to over 3,000 people. Steve and Tammy's aim is to communicate the Bible in a creative and relevant manner. Now, anytime I hear the words like creative and relevant to describe preaching and teaching the Bible, my ears perk up. Now, is there anything wrong with being creative and relevant? Well, no, not in general. But it's always a red flag when it becomes the basis by which one approaches the preaching or proclaiming of the Word of God. Now, perhaps I can explain that better as we go. This sermon is part of a series called Encounters. And the sermon title is called Extreme Makeovers. Now, Steve has looked at various people who have encountered God and how it changed them. He's looked at people such as Isaiah, uh, Joshua, and Mary. Today he's looking at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became known as the Apostle Paul. Steve will be using Luke's account in Acts chapter 9. Paul's conversion is also retold in two other places in Acts as well. Now let me say first off that after hearing some of the other sermons in this series, I, I can tell that Steve loves God and loves his word and actually refers to it quite often as he preaches, which is very refreshing. So, let's get started. Try it. Try it with me. Extreme. How, how many have ever seen one of those shows? I, I love to see. I love to see. Once in a while, my wife will turn on that, the 600-pound life. Uh, I, I said in the last service, the 600-pound wife, that's not the name of the show. It's the 600-pound life. And I love to see the transformation of, of somebody that weighed, you know, was a lot, they lost a, a lot of weight over a period of year. Love, love the before and after. And we have a couple photos of uh, some before. Check it out. Before and... Come on. Yeah, let's all say it together. Wow. And, wow. Uh, Pastor Ray, before and, and after. <laughs> Now, I suppose this comes under the creative and relevant category. I've become convinced that to grow a church numerically into the thousands, this kind of thing you just have to do, along with uh, creating a concert-like atmosphere and a rock-style praise band. I celebrate all of those physical transformations. What, what I'm more excited about, and I think what you're more excited about, and I know that God's more excited about, is spiritual transformations. There are certain predictable steps that all of us go through when we are going through a spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformations? Yeah, I'm confused by that term. It implies a change from one kind of spirituality to another. But the Bible speaks of spiritual life as opposed to being spiritually dead. For example, Ephesians 2.1, Paul writes this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So, Let's see where Steve goes with this idea of spiritual transformation. And I, I just have two points for you today. I'm going to make it really easy. We want to get out of here because we got some Father's Day stuff to get to, right? Only two points because it's Father's Day and we want to get out of here? Man, how can a pastor say that? I mean, Steve, every Sunday is the Heavenly Father's Day. And your job is to proclaim His Word to His people. Why is it that so many megachurch pastors seem to cater to the non-Christians in the crowd rather than God's people? 
See, the mega church's strength is also its greatest weakness. Make the service as enjoyable as possible, in other words, worldly, to unbelievers, so they will come, and they do come, but in doing so, it is at the expense of the true believer who is there to worship God and hear him speak to them through his word. Now, Steve begins on a solid premise. God can save anyone. Now, we're going to study the life of Saul. Here's what's cool about Saul. At one time, he hassled Christians. We're going to read about that. He hurt them, and ultimately, he killed them. But he became one. Now, that's right. In Acts chapter 9, we find the story of Paul's conversion from being a persecutor of the church to being an apostle of the church. Now, conversion, what is that? Well, simply this. Turning from rebellion and resistance towards God to faith in God and repentance over the sin and rebellion within us. And the question is this. Should we look at the conversion of Saul to Paul as normative for each Christian? Did you ever have that in your life? Like you would look at other Christians. You went to the club on Saturday night. Mm-mm-mm. 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 And then the, somebody said, hey, we got to leave. We're going to church tomorrow. You're like, Ch- what? What did you say? You're going to what? Ch- Church. I'm staying, I'm staying here. And you were clubbing and you were partying and you were drinking. And you were doing all kinds of crazy things and you laughed at Christians. And when somebody told you that they tithe 10%, you're like, that's crazy. And You know, what Christian is going to tell a non-Christian that they tithe 10%? I mean, that's, that's a strange thing that he would say that. You read your Bible and you sing songs and you lift your hands and you used to laugh at them, make fun of them and mock them and check it out. Now you're one. And during the worship set, you were lifting your hands and you thought, man, I would have never done that. I would have never given 10% of my income away. I would have never been to church on a Sunday morning and you're here. And there's that 10% tithe thing again. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? Ready to dive in? Verse 1, meanwhile, Saul was still, notice the word there, still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Well, the reason why it says still there, because in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen, who was the first martyr in the Bible, was getting killed, Saul was there basically going, good job, good job, good job. He was not only hurting and hassling Christians, Saul was there killing them himself. And so he's still breathing threats. Oh, not quite. Luke tells us that Saul was a young man and was present at the stoning of Stephen. Saul was deeply religious. As I mentioned before, Paul's story of his conversion is told three times in Acts. Here in chapter 9, in Acts 22 after being arrested at the temple, and then in Acts 26 when he stood before King Agrippa. There, Paul says, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, remember he was a Roman citizen, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. He says this of his former life in his letter to the Philippians as well. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. You see, there's little doubt that when he heard Stephen speak, it drove him wild with utter contempt and scorn for this new sect of Christians. Remember in Acts 7.58, And they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 3, As he neared Damascus on his journey, love this, love this. As he was making his way to Damascus, here it is. Suddenly. Suddenly. Isn't that how God does it? I say this all the time, most of us, we were just cruising along in our life, thinking we were too sexy for our shirt. And what happened? What happened? Suddenly, suddenly God got a hold of us. Now, of course, there is a sense in which the conversion of Saul to Paul was dramatically sudden. He sees a bright light. He falls to the ground and he hears the voice of the glorified and ascended Jesus from the right hand of the Father. But in another sense, it was not so sudden. It's interesting that in the account of Paul before King Agrippa, he says this. 
And when I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, a goad was a sharp stick used to prod a rebellious animal back in line. The more they rebelled, the more thrusts of the goad they would get. Now, think back to Paul's command of the Hebrew Scriptures and how it must have infuriated and confused him to hear Stephen say at the end of his sweeping survey of the Old Testament, he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, he's talking about Jesus there, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Think also of what Paul would have thought of the godliness of Stephen right before he died at the hands of those hurling stones at him when Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. See, perhaps both of these things beforehand, God was using to finally bring Paul to his knees. This is a guy that hurt Christians, hassled Christians, killed Christians. You want to know also something about the Apostle Paul? He was highly educated. You know, typically highly educated people are hard to win to the gospel. And here's the reason why. They're so smart, they don't think they need God. I mean, you go to any Ivy League school on the East Coast, and, and those, they're so smart. And when you say, hey, hey, but you're lost. Who do you think you are, man? Why? Because the Bible says, knowledge, what does knowledge do? It puffs up. We walk around like a big head. I don't need God. And, and Saul was one of the most educated people. Check it out. He was also highly religious. How I many know highly religious people are hard to win to Jesus? Because they, they already think they got it going on. It's the hooker and the prostitute that know their thing isn't working. Now, point of clarification here, folks. We don't win anyone to Jesus, smart or simple. That's the Holy Spirit's work. The words of Dr. R. Scott Clark sum it up very nicely here. He says this, This is why we preach the gospel freely, promiscuously, seriously to all. Whoever will may come indeed, and it is God the Holy Spirit working through and with the preaching of the gospel who determines in any given time whosoever will. He gives new life. He gives faith, and through that faith, he creates a living spiritual union with Christ. Again, we don't win anyone to Jesus. Our job is simply to witness and to testify to the truth of the gospel message. And so check it out. He's on his way to kill more Christians, and then God intervenes suddenly, gets his attention. Check this out. Here's a whole sermon within a sermon right now. That the Christian was on his way to kill more Christians, and God stopped it. Can we just thank God this, this afternoon for all the things in our life that he stopped? Some of you almost lost your mind. God stopped it. There's some people in this section right here, you're all, you almost lost your marriage. But God intervened and he stopped it. Yes, that's true. God is a merciful and loving God. But see how the focus has shifted from the text to the person sitting in the seat? Now, there should always be application, of course. But first, the text being preached, in this case, the conversion of Paul, must be proclaimed and explicated. And let's all agree, folks, sometimes God doesn't stop it. Sometimes people, Christians, lose their minds. Sometimes they lose their houses, their jobs, and even their marriages. But God, who is not the author of sin, remains a merciful and loving God all the same. Now, Steve is going to go on in verse 10. He's going to talk about Paul's first contact with a Christian since he encountered the living Lord Christ. This is, this, is, this is going to preach. Isn't it interesting when you and I decide to live a life of rebellion, we are constantly bumping into other Christians, okay? Isn't that interesting? Hey, I'm just going to do my own thing. But guess what? God's going to 
You're going to find Christians all over the place. That's all right. Isn't this true? A few years ago, my wife and I were going to lunch. We're just driving our car, minding our own business, and my wife says, hey, I think that's so-and-so in the church. And as I looked out the window, I noticed that so-and-so, who was married, was like leaning on a car with this guy that she wasn't married, and they're about, they're about to... And I'm like, honey, what should we do? And she's all, turn around. I'm like, let's do it. So we turned around and pulled into the parking lot, broad daylight. It was like a Tuesday, broad daylight. And she's like going in for the... And we roll down the window, we're like... God bless you, how you doing? Not quite apples for apples there, Steve. See, Paul's rebellion against the God he thought he was serving was truly beastly. It was beast-like. He hated Christians and therefore hated Jesus Christ. But after being blinded and falling to the ground and hearing the Lord's piercing voice, after having to be led like a little child to Damascus, now that wouldn't be normative for most conversions, okay? It was, that was special for Paul. Well, after being led there, there was no more rebellion. Rebellion had turned into repentance. This is where it's helpful to use parallel passages to more fully bring out the richness of God's word. Acts 22, Paul falls to the ground and answers, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? You see, that is solid evidence of repentance right there. So check this out in verse, verse, the end of verse 10. I love this. So, so God says, uh, Ananias. Look at this. Ananias. Yes, Lord. It, isn't that how you want to respond to God? Yes. Steve. Yeah, yes, Lord. I want, I want you to give more than 10% of your income. Yes, Lord. Steve, I want you to use your gifts for me. What's the answer? Steve, I want, when you go to the gym, don't just play racquetball. Steve, I want you to pray for somebody. I want you to invite somebody. Yes, Lord. Here, here, I've come to the conclusion, all my money is his. The gifts that he's given me, which aren't that many, they're his. Talent, it's all his. Everything, everything I have is his. Yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do. That's the way you and I respond to him. Yes, Lord. So Ananias is like, yes, Lord. Everything's yours, God. And God's like, okay, I got one thing for you. How I many know it's always like one thing? So, so notice what, what God says in the text. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named... What? What? All the God's people said... Okay, I'm willing. That was good, by the way. <laughs> I'm willing to do anything, Ananias. I'm willing to do anything, God. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the straight street, and there's going to be a man there named Saul. Guys, Ananias and his concern about Saul is secondary to the thrust of the text and to this extreme makeover theme of the sermon. What Steve is missing is the spiritual resurrection that occurred in the life of Paul. Look at, look at verse 6. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Saul, who was dead in his sin and trespasses, persecuting God's people in the name of God, lays there as a dead man on the ground. And Jesus says to him, rise and go. You see, this is a great picture of a true conversion. Paul will go on to talk about this resurrection in Colossians 2.13. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. I, I just got to be honest with you, Pastor Steve. Uh, we, we like living here in Ventura County, but we've talked to many realtors. We've talked to uh, people in finance, and they, they, they've told, a lot of people have told us the same thing over and over. We've heard it from five people. There's no way we're able to be able to uh, afford a house here in Ventura County on our two incomes. Stop telling God what you heard. 
Now again, Steve is using a tiny piece of the text, verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, which Paul's retelling in Acts chapter 22 does not even mention. And, and he's talking about trusting God for that house you want to buy or that job you want to get. Folks, God does care about the details of our lives, but one, this is not in line with the main topic of conversation here, you know, the main thrust of the text. And two, you may not get that house or that job. And it's not because God doesn't love you if you are in Christ. If you're in Christ, God is purposing all things for your good and his glory, even if you don't get what you think you really want at the moment. Hey Amen. Here's the second thing. Write the second thing down. God can use anyone. God can use anyone. Pretty excited about that, that God can use anyone. And notice here in verse 15, Go, this man has chosen my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the other people of Israel. A chosen instrument. Paul, a Pharisee, drenched in the law, and one who lived a life of extreme conformance to the external commands of God, which produced immense self-righteousness. Who better to proclaim God's grace to sinners, both Jews and Gentiles? Paul was a chosen instrument of God. Paul comes to this conclusion himself in Galatians 1. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, now he's talking about election there, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See, he's undoubtedly referring right there to his conversion on the Damascus Road. I'm all into training. I'm all into equipping. I'm all into resourcing. But look, you can get saved today and be used by God tonight. You don't have to wait. God will save anyone. God will use anyone. Uh, yes, God can use anyone at any time. But Steve, that's not the point of the text. I'm blown away by verse 15. It paralyzed me. The, the same guy that hurt, hassled, and killed Christians, now God's saying, chosen instrument. Look this way. This is the reality over our lives. This is what, listen, this is what we hear ourselves tell us. This is what we hear the enemy. This might even be other uh, voices that other people have spoken over our life. And I mean, oh, this is the reality. Everybody in the room is prideful, arrogant, selfish, myself included, right? This is true of the Apostle Paul. But praise God, this is no longer a reality. This is what God says about each and every one in the room. Hey, hey a chosen instrument of mine, chosen by, by God. Each and every one in the room? Well, I agree with that first part of the sign, but the second? Is not Steve being just a wee bit presumptuous here? I mean, how does he know whom God has chosen, or as Paul says, set apart before they were born and called by his grace? Listen, not only would I say not, don't believe the, the voices that you would tell yourself or other people would speak over your life. Never put those words over anybody else's life. Never say that person will never be used by God. I told you the story. Somebody, a good friend of mine in my wedding, I will not mention his name. What's his name? Said, Steve Abraham will never amount to anything in ministry. And of course, we know that's wrong because Steve is now the pastor of a 3,000 plus member medium sized megachurch. So don't hold that over anybody else's. God can do anything, God can save anyone, God can use anyone. Can I get an amen in the house? Now again, that's true, but the text is really about the power of God to convert a sinful, wretched person, Paul and us. Steve will now depart from preaching God's word and instead use precious preaching time to interview a couple in his church. I wanna invite uh, Hector and Cecilia to come up and just kind of talk a little bit about their story. So why don't you welcome them as they come forward?
Now, I listened to this interview and they sound like really great people with servant hearts and they have a great story. But that's not preaching, folks. Now, to the close of the service, where Steve tries to close, or let's say seal the deal, as it were, with the unsaved in the crowd. There's, there's a void in your life. In fact, I, I tell people all the time, you know that God puts a void in our heart? It's a hole that can only be filled by him. And you can try, I'm telling you, you can try money. You can try working your way up the corporate ladder. You can try relationships. You can, you can sleep around. You can party. You can do all those things. I'm telling you, after all of that, you're still going to have the hole in your heart. It can only be filled by God. And so maybe you're here today and you, you've heard the story you, we, as we preached on the, the book of Acts and the Apostle Paul that maybe you're in your chair and you're like, man, I, I know there's something missing. And as, as we were singing earlier and I, I looked around and I saw people lift their hands and I don't really understand everything, but I know I'm missing something. Here's what you're missing. You're missing Jesus. Is that the problem really? That we have a hole in our heart and, and only Jesus can fill it? <laughs> that we're missing something in our lives and it's Jesus? <laughs> Or is it a much deeper problem than that? Is, isn't it rather that apart from Jesus Christ and his perfect life and death on our behalf as sinners, we are dead in sin and rebellion. We're hostile towards God, the God who created us. And because of that, Paul says, Ephesians 5, 5, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And remember what Jesus said about the sin in your heart being just as bad as doing it with your hands. Paul goes on, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. In other words, apart from God's grace in Jesus Christ, you are under the wrath of God and headed for an eternity feeling the weight and the agony of God's turned face and his divine displeasure. And God brought you to this church, this service, at this time to tell you he loves you, he's got a great plan for you, and he wants to save you. You say, well, you keep saying save. What, what does that mean? Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, unless you're born again or unless you're saved, you can't go to heaven. And I never knew that going to church my whole life. I, I never knew that you had to, like I've heard that term born again. I always thought it was like weird people that were born again. And to be born again just means this, that all of us obviously were born one time physically. To be born again means to be spiritually reborn. And it's not a religious thing that you do. It's, it's just, it, it's this simple. Jesus Christ, I know there's something missing in my life. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. See, friends, there's no such thing as a non-born-again Christian. To be born again is to be born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus said. This supernatural act of God upon sinful man was prophesied by Ezekiel in chapter 36. I think it's verse 25. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, says the Lord, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And, I, and from your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. You see, if Jesus had to wait for Paul to confess him as Lord on his own, well, he would have been waiting a long, long time. Jesus was not telling Nicodemus that he must go out and get born again on his own. Being born again does not come about by confessing Jesus as Lord. Confessing Jesus as Lord comes about by having been born again or regenerated by the Spirit of God. Our salvation is all of God, and it's all of His grace. Saved from a, a purposeless life on this earth, and saved from an eternity without God. See, for the unbeliever, there would be nothing they'd like better than an eternity without God. But I'm going to say it again. Apart from God's grace in Jesus Christ, the unbeliever is under the wrath of God and headed for an eternity, carrying the weight and agony of his turned face and his divine displeasure. It's, it's in fact being in the presence of God, who is a consuming fire, without a mediator. 
He's eternally your judge and not your father. Honestly, it's really simple. The hard part is what Jesus had to do to die in our place. And he said, hey, if you'll just believe that I'm the only way to get to heaven, and you'll confess that, he says, I'll come into your life and I'll be your savior, I'll be your Lord, and you'll be born again. The easy part is just believing, uh, no way. Faith in God is a gift from God. We don't just decide on our own, by our own free will. Well, we have free will, but it's a sinful free will that's against God and his goodness. We don't just decide to believe, well, because a pastor's sermon was so engaging or funny or relevant or even biblical. Faith in Jesus Christ only comes to those whom God has chosen beforehand to receive it. Being born again or regenerated is a true spiritual conversion of the heart that's brought about by the Holy Spirit, where the sinful nature of a person is renewed so they can respond to God in faith. Be then saved and then truly desire from then on to live, not perfectly, but live in accordance with God's will. Titus 3.5 tells us this. He, that is God, saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. See, how does a person get saved? By God causing them to be born again, which is exactly what he did in the life of Paul. And if you were the only person living on this planet, Jesus still would have come 2,000 years ago to die in your place because he loves you and he's got a great plan for your life. Now, I've heard that before and, and it sounds great. I mean, it makes me think I'm kind of special, but it misses the point. Jesus came to save sinners who on their own would never turn to him in faith. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. But maybe you've never, you can't look back to a time in your life where you said, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, I want to make you my Lord and Savior. But if you want to open up your life to Christ today, I would be honored and privileged to pray for anybody in the room. So I'm going to start on the far right side of the building. If that's you, you're saying, Steve, would you pray for me? I want to be saved. I want to be born again. Right now, would you open up your eyes, lift up your hand, and look right at me? And I just want to agree with anybody. I agree with you in Jesus' name. Anybody else? All the way in the back, I agree with you in Jesus' name. Go ahead, lift up your hand. Don't be ashamed. I agree with you in Jesus' name. And I agree with you too, in Jesus' name. All the way in the back there, I see your hand. I agree with you in Jesus' name. There's, there's five people in this section. I agree with you. Anybody in the middle section, just go ahead and lift up your hand. Now, I'm being a little facetious here, but this is what I call conversion by coercion. <laughs> As if the power of Steve's personality or his illustrations and humor could alone persuade people to confess Christ. And I'm sorry, folks, it doesn't work that way. This emotional plea to ask Jesus into one's heart, a request I cannot find anywhere in Scripture, by the way, and Steve's call for immediate response, well, that produces only a temporary spiritual experience much of the time. Instead, Steve, why not trust the Holy Spirit to do his work through the proper preaching of the word? And by that, I mean actually sticking to the text. In this case, the conversion of Paul and the elements that were unique to him and those that are common to every Christian. You see, in this story, we have four main elements that make up a true conversion. A present state of rebellion towards God, a true repentance because of sin, a spiritual resurrection, and a revolution of one's relationship to God and to God's people. I mean, think back to the story. The Lord says to Ananias, go to the street called Straight and to the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Another evidence of the conversion of Saul to Paul. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul. Oh, what music that must have been in the apostle Paul's ears. Nothing to be embarrassed of. You're like, I know, but if I go up there, then what are people going to think about me? I already know what they think. They think you're incredible. They think you're awesome. They think, well, they just want to thank you for making the greatest decision ever. 
So if you're one of the ones that lifted your hand for the first time or you rededicated your life in a minute, come forward. Friends, if you are a Christian, there is no need to rededicate or recommit your life by coming forward every Sunday because you had a bad week. Every time you sin, you feel like you need to recommit yourself to Christ. What is needed in the worship service is a time of confession of sin corporately and a corporate assurance of pardon to those who are trusting in Jesus Christ to save them. This is also why the Lord's Supper is so vital in the life of the church. For it is there that we once again hear and receive the word, and this time it's visible word. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. It represents the forgiveness of sins.